How many of you remember Joe Friday? Oh, yeah. Just the facts, ma'am. <laughs> Guess what? According to everything I've been able to find, he never said those exact words. He said things that referred to it, but he never said, just the facts, ma'am. So, an example of how sometimes fiction can creep in when you're trying to do nonfiction. So, our goal today, you know, Grace talked about memoirs, and that's one form of nonfiction. We're going to talk about several forms in this period, and we're going to attempt, as we do so, to give you some tools that are going to make your life a lot easier. Okay, anybody open for some new tools? Great. Remember when you're writing nonfiction. Non being the operative word there, the part of the word. It's supposed to be true. So you're going to start with the facts. Okay, so the facts plant the seed of the story. You want to start with the facts. So begin with them. Who? Who's involved in the story? Whether it's you telling a first person story, or you've interviewed people and you're writing an article about them, you know, you've got to start with who is in the story. What? Hmm, what is the story? What's happening or happened that your article is about, your story? Whether it be you know, two inches wide in the local newspaper, if there is such a thing anymore, or a blog online, part of a textbook, doesn't matter. <coughs> Who, what are your starting points, then where? Where did it happen? You know, I can say, oh, we went for the greatest burger. Who's we? What made it the greatest burger? And where was this greatest burger before I get very far with it? Or people are going to go, what do I care? When? When did we go for this burger? Did we go after church? Did we go after the symposium? Where did we get the burger? Always, and, and when did we go there to get it? Got to get those important facts in. Why? Why did we choose a burger? Why didn't we go for tacos or spaghetti or... Chicken. There you go. You know, why a burger? What was it about that burger that made us want to have a burger? And then finally, how? How did we go? Did we drive over? Did we hike over? Did we skip over? Were we out jogging? that was our destination? <coughs> Doesn't matter as long as we are telling the facts about it. That's the bare bones. You might think of it as the skeleton instead of the seed. You've got a lot of ways to look at it. But the seed of the story starts with the facts. Your job as a writer is to take those seeds and sprout them. Help them grow. Help them blossom and tell the complete story. So, what is nonfiction? Well, we've already talked about the non part being important, meaning that it is not fiction, it's true. Okay, but it might fall into a lot of categories. It might be journalism, news stories, newspapers, magazines radio, television, whatever, where you're reporting news. Gee, Grace, you want to say this one for me? <laughs> <laughs> Memoirs, those personal memories. Now, if you look over there on my rack, you'll see that there are five chicken soup for the soul books over there. That's five of the six that I've had the honor to appear in, thanks to Grace and her mentoring, which got me in the first one. 
Chicken Soup for the Soul is uplifting stories that are basically mini memoirs. Some event, some occurrence, well fleshed out, that tells that little story <coughs> that will help someone else, encourage them, lift them up, let them know they're not alone. That's what Chicken Soup is all about. Human interest. Now, this might also be in journalism, you know, in the same category as journalism, the, the newspaper, magazine, whatever. But human interest is a little less time sensitive than news. And guess what? That gives you a better chance at being factual. You know, everybody, have you ever seen, I, I should say, because some of you guys are a whole lot younger than me, the headline, and I saw it in class, I didn't see it for real, but Dewey defeats Truman, okay? That was the rush to get the story out, and it wasn't right. Human interests were less time sensitive. We're not meeting a deadline. We're not trying to beat everybody else out on the street. So we can take a little more time and build that story a little more thoroughly. I love human interest. That's always been my, even when I was on the high school newspaper, human interest was my favorite thing to write. Feature stories. I didn't want to do the hard news. I didn't want to do the sports. I wanted to do people. And that's what human interest is about. Travel or food focused stories. I mean, there are whole blogs dedicated to things like travel and food and, oh gosh, you know, what else? The latest fashions, the latest eye makeup. Whole blogs devo devoted to eye makeup, really? But they can do it. Nonfiction, if they're doing it right, if they're showing techniques and skills, it's nonfiction. You want to make sure it's right. Inspirational stories. Now, I, I see chocolate nodding. This, this lady writes some of the most amazing inspirational stories. Tina is another one with the inspirational works that help to lift us up, to inspire us to be better when we finish that story than we were when we started it. Chicken Soup for the Soul is a lot like that. And let me just throw an ad in here right now. If you have not already done so, go to chickensoup.com. Scroll down to the bottom of the page where it says Submit a Story. Click that link and find out what they're looking for right then. Because A, they pay. And B, they give you 10 copies of the book that you can do with as you please. Uh, it's a good deal. And being published in Chicken Soup for the Soul is a doorway into many other venues. Because they may not look at you and go, well, we don't know who you are. But they know who Chicken Soup is. They know what Chicken Soup is. And that will get you. And I've done a lot of signings based on Chicken Soup for the Soul at major bookstores. And, oh, can I bring my other books too? Yeah. If it's in their catalog, they let me bring it. And guess what? I make sure my books are in their catalog. <laughs> you know, if they can order it, they're good. So, inspirational stories are always good tools. Academic. Teaching tools, teaching materials, scientific analysis. I spent a good bit of the last three decades writing training materials for a company in, in Chicago. Helping with the training materials, helping promote the company. It's gotta be nonfiction because you're telling users about what they're gonna see when they go in to use this program or what the capabilities are that will help them do their work more easily. That's nonfiction as well. Business writings, not just how to use it, but also what can it do for your business. These are the mechanics. This is what it's going to do for you. And sometimes the two are part of the same story, sometimes not. 
but always factual, always telling the truth about what's going on. Everybody okay so far? Did I leave out your favorite form of nonfiction? Because this is just some examples. This is by no means an exhaustive list. I didn't figure you wanted to be here till dinner time. Historical writing. Yeah. History. There you go. Historical. Well, I, I kind of included that under academic, yeah. sort of, kind of. Anybody else? Okay. So, nonfiction is not equal to non-entertaining, or it shouldn't be. <laughs> Unfortunately, there are some people who make it that way, and you just want to throw the book out the window and never look at it again, or, you know, it, it makes good fodder for fire. Okay. Readers want more than just a dry rendition of the facts. They don't just want who, what, where, when, how, why. They want to know how that applies to them, to their lives, to their community, whatever it is. So you want to bring in all the other aspects, not just this dry list. Your job as a writer is to add depth and meaning to the story. How are you going to do that? With your insights, your research, your emotions. That's what you want to bring to the table when you're writing nonfiction. Entertain your reader, and they'll continue to read. Now, I'm going to pick on Jan for a moment because, you know, she mentioned getting information from people all over the world who have read her columns. They continue to read her. I get people who go, oh, I love your articles in Southern Senior. You want to build that readership if you are in a regular venue. You don't always have that opportunity. Sometimes it's a one-shot deal. But if you are in something where you're going to continue to publish, that nonfiction, Entertain your readers, and they'll look for you next time. And if you're not in there next time, they may be on the phone to somebody going, or email to somebody going, what happened to Jan's article this week? Where was Jan? I missed Jan's article. By the way, the recognition factor of doing something like that is great for your other books because Oh, I like her articles. I like the columns that she writes. Let me see about this book. So, nonfiction can build a bridge for you into other things. But we're going to start with getting the nonfiction right. So, what should you consider as you are writing? What should you have in the back of your mind the whole time? Well, First off, identify your market. Where do you want to sell it? Or if it is a continuing market, what do they want from you? What are they looking for from you? They don't always, um, you know, when you're submitting for the first time, you don't always know exactly what it is. 20 years of sending the chicken soup and not quite making the cut. Thank you, Grace. <laughs> you know, uh, 20 years I sent in stories to Chicken Soup. Now, I didn't do it real faithfully. I didn't do it every week. I didn't do it constantly. But over that 20 years, I probably sent in 100, 120 stories. And nothing happened. Now, a lot of those stories found homes other places. But didn't get into chicken soup until Grace mentored me into transparency and not worrying about being perfect you know, depicting myself it wasn't about me being perfect it was about me helping someone else see uh, you know my weakness my foibles whatever it was that might help them grow that's what mentors do and I will be eternally grateful 
to Grace for her help there. Next, identify your audience. And sometimes you already know from your market, but sometimes not. Let's say, for example, you've pitched a story to a hunting and fishing magazine. Okay. You know who the market is, hunting and fishing magazine, but who is your audience? Is it going to be the hunters? Is it going to be the fishers? Is it going to be gun aficionados? Is it going to be archery fans? Who is it within that magazine that will be reading it? And you want to take that into consideration as you're writing. Because if you paint it with too broad a brush, thinking that, oh, I'll appeal to everybody, what usually happens is you don't appeal to anybody. You know, it's like, think about making a pie. Well, Laura likes them sweet, and Jill likes them a little bit salty, and Doug, bless his heart, likes chocolate icing. And, you know, and if I try to, ple and, you know, maybe Grace likes pineapple filling, and if I try to please all of those people, it's going to be a pretty stinky pie. So, who is your target audience? And sometimes those two come together as, as you know, you know one so you know the other. And sometimes your audience is a, a portion of that market rather than the whole market. What point of view are you going to use? Are you going to tell it from your own point of view, first person? Now we're getting into memoirs. Or are you going to tell it third person? Are you going to tell it second person? Are you going to be interviewing people and compiling all of that? Where are you going to be in terms of point of view? Because that's going to govern a lot of it as well. What tone will you take? Now this can be tricky. Part of it may be governed by your market. You know, I'm not going to be writing for the New York Times, you know, news section with a humorous take. So part of it is governed by your market. But sometimes, especially like me with the feature articles, I had a little more freedom to choose my tone. And with Southern Senior, I have a lot of freedom to choose the tone that I want to use. Am I going to be flippant? Am I going to be serious? Am I going to be intense? Am I going to be flighty? I can do any of those things. But I have to settle on my tone before I start. And if I don't, I'm going to run into trouble. What vocabulary will you use? Hmm. This one gets a little bit tricky because you want to make sure that you're using the vocabulary that's appropriate for your audience. If you're writing for Scientific American, it's a whole different vocabulary than if you're writing for Kids R Us. You want to make sure that you're using the appropriate vocabulary. Jargon if it's appropriate, but don't use it if it's not. Now, I've ran into this not too long ago with Laura because we were putting together a program and I made the note in there about WIP. And she kind of went, you know, not everybody's going to know what that is. And she was right. I just totally... You know, I was thinking in terms of I'm going to be delivering this and explaining as opposed to in the handout, just WIP. Now, I know that it's work in progress. And most of you are, you know, I see the nods. Yeah, you know WIP. But not everyone does. And so that's the kind of thing you want to be careful about, that you don't use jargon that's going to be confusing to your reader. What's the pace of your article? Are you going to be talking to them 90 miles an hour? I grew up in the Ninth Ward, honey. I can talk 90 miles an hour. Let me tell you. 
<laughs> or are you going to be delivering it in a more, shall we say, calm pace? Well, for us as writers, pace is on the page. It's not in the voice. But go back and read it aloud after you finish it. And what does the pace tell you? Are you covering what you want to cover as you want to cover it in an appropriate pacing? Okay. Um, I, I hate to really be a nag on this, but if you're writing something very, very short, then please be succinct with it. Don't try to cram in more information than the space can hold and try to do it so fast so that it, they'll, no. What'll happen is they'll go, huh? What'd she say? Make sure that your length, your topic, your pace go together. Your readers will be much more pleased with it. They'll be much more likely to look for your next work. Next, let's talk about your hook. Your hook is the thing you're going to use to send out into the world that hopefully your readers are going to bite on. It's the bait to make them want to read more. So you want to make that hook interesting, compelling. You don't want it to be boring. You don't want it to put them to sleep. You don't want them to go, eh, and go on. Now, in journalism, we call it the lead. Most writing, we call it the hook. It's just a, an assortment of terms for the same thing. Bait your hook with the information that you've gathered and the answers to those previous questions. Once you do, and then stay consistent, you're going to land your readers. So once you've determined your audience, your market, the point of view you're going to use, all those items, then stay consistent with it as you go through. Do your research. Now, Grace touched on this. and. Research is just, you know, it's a really important part of writing nonfiction because we all remember things differently. I have a sister who swears up and down that my aunt and uncle did not ever live on North Robertson Street. Like, they lived on North Robertson Street, backed up to our house on Cluett. I used to jump the back fence to babysit. I know they lived on North Robertson Street. Oh, no, they never lived there. Because you know what? She's six years younger than I am. She doesn't remember them living on North Robertson Street. So to her memory, they never lived there. And that's a problem with human memory. If we just rely on our memory, even for our own memoirs, we can get into trouble. So you want to make sure that you are doing the research that you need to do. Sometimes that research is interviews and quotations. Now, Lee, I'm going to pick on you now. Lee McElveen is the lady that I met interviewing her for an article about her art. I would never have gone and talked with her and done all that and then written the article without referring back to the notes to get the quotations right. Those are the sort of things that you want to make sure are correct because nonfiction requires accuracy. If you are inaccurate, you can potentially open yourself up to liability as well as losing readers. Now, the problem right now is in the, the world that we live in, sometimes the news is about the little piece that sounds like a, a salacious, I love that word, 
you know, the little piece that sounds like a big deal. Sound yeah. And take it out of context and throw it out there. And if people don't read the whole story, they think that's the story. Oh, let's just scan Yahoo headlines and we'll know what's going on in the world. <laughs> and unfortunately, that doesn't always work. So, you know, it, inaccuracy can leave you open to liability and it can turn readers off. And in readers who get turned off are readers you have lost. We run into that in fiction a little. If we do something, let's say, historically inaccurate, they might, in the comments on Amazon, say, well, you know, she had him using this kind of a weapon, and that wasn't even invented until 10 years later. But it's not going to leave you open to the liability of somebody charging you about something. Okay, now, let me show you an example of what research can provide. As I mentioned, I grew up in New Orleans in the Ninth Ward. The NOLA Theater was a local movie house. And when I was 11 years old, the ceiling caved in. Now, I remembered the ceiling caving in. I remember being young. I remember that we were in church when it happened a block away at Grace Baptist Church. <laughs> <laughs> and we were in revival. We had a guest speaker. Well, that guest speaker had a field day because we had all the noise and the, the police sirens and the fire department and everything else going on. I remember, I can't remember his name, but I remember him standing up there making the comment once the deacons came back with the report of what had happened. Well, if they'd been in church where they belonged, they wouldn't have been in danger. Now, to my little brain, that was very unkind. And I was just kind of like, what? Now, fortunately, the pastor, Brother Scharfenstein, got up. And when he spoke, he said, let's stop for a moment and let's have prayer for the people affected, the people trying to help them, you know, the whole thing. He did a kind response. And I remember that to this day. I, I always loved the man because he was just a really, um, he was the father figure you always want your pastor to be. And... I remember that as just an example of his kindness. Now, he was, he was strict. I mean, you did not run in church or, you know, misbehave, but he was kind. And that night showed it. Now, here's the problem. I remember that it happened. I did not remember the date. But through the news research, the news article, I could research and find out when it happened, what time in the evening it happened, the actual date. I could get the accurate location, because guess what? The NOLA Theater isn't there anymore. It's an empty lot, according to Google Maps. Because when I tried to pull it up to see what was in that space now, it's an empty lot. <laughs> but I could get the address to run Google Maps from the news article. An accurate casualty report. Now, I knew that one of my school buddies had been outside the theater, paying for his ticket. He was going in to see the movie. As I read the casualty reports in this article, I found out that another one of my school buddies had been inside and had been lightly injured. You know, thank you, Lord. Uh, he came out with a few scratches and was taken to the hospital and sent on his way. But I didn't even remember that he had been involved. An accurate emergency responder list. Who showed up? How many engine companies? How many police officers? How many ambulances? 
How many hospitals were they taken to? All of that in the article. I could find that out by doing research. Couldn't get it from my memory. I mean, that's been, uh, you know, as uh, my one of the kids says, I've slept since then. <laughs> you know, and that's the truth. I've slept since then. I don't remember all of the details. It's vivid to me that it happened, but all of the details aren't there. But if I'm putting together a story about the impact of the theater roof ceiling collapse, I supply the tone. I supply the emotion. I can do it from my perspective as an outsider looking in and worrying about my friends because I knew some of my friends were going to the theater that night. Or I could do it about the unkind way that a pastor can respond and turn people off. I can do it about the kind way that a pastor can respond and draw people closer to the Lord. I get to pick that tone. I get to supply the emotion. And that's what makes it not just a news story with the facts, but something more. Any of you have a flashbulb moment you'd like to mention? No. Oh, you're going to think about it later and you're going to email me. <laughs> Let me know what your flashbulb moment was. Freshman in college. Only Sunday morning ever got up early to study. The whole dorm went, bam! I thought somebody had blown a speaker downstairs. Next thing I you know, my sister's on the phone. Mount St. Helens just went off, and they're going to go east of the mountain and pick us mash. <laughs> there you go. Yeah, I was heading back home to my house after Katrina, and I was going down the street. I can make a story of that. And all I was worried about was, because my house was on stilts on the bayou, mm -hmm. is it slid in the water or not? And you can imagine the panic and scare I felt if my house was going to be there. Even if it's crooked, you're not allowed in. Okay, let, let me just suggest to you that that kind of story can be a powerful tool to help people understand what we face down here. There are a lot of people who go, well, it's a hurricane, just leave. But what about the stuff you can't take with you like the house? that kind of a story can reach people and educate them. And that's what nonfiction is about. Reaching them, teaching them, doing something more than just reporting the facts. So here we go, got some facts for you. Take a look at this. Three Bridges Stadium reported attendance of 2,500 for the football game Friday night. Community High School won. That's the facts. What questions might you ask to flesh out the story? What was the other school? Amen. You know, who, who was the other school? What was the score? What was the score? What are some of the highlights from the game? What are the big plays? Was it cold that night? <laughs> yeah, the, te the weather, the temperature. How much money of the tickets? Oh, thank you. Thank you. That's the kind of questions you might ask. Now, other things might be, what if the name isn't Three Bridges Stadium? Maybe it's Johnson Stadium. Who's the Johnson it was named for? Why was it named for? Did the Johnson family endow it? Was Johnson a big football player on that, for that school? Well, and, and of course the big one, where in the world is Three Bridges Stadium? If you're not local, you won't know where that is. Yeah. That's the kind of things that you as a writer are going to ask to flesh it out. And then as you get the answers to those questions, with luck, if you ask good questions, they lead to more questions. And sometimes you get more than one story out of it's a story. 
because I might do one about the game Friday night, but then I might also do one about the fact that it's a brand new stadium and this was the first game ever played in it. Or that it replaces the old wooden bleachers that burned down Fourth of July when somebody's fireworks went awry. You know, there's all kinds of ways that you can build that story and that more stories, more potential places you can submit it. Don't ever just look at the facts and look at the story and go, okay, that's it. Because that story can lead to another story, can lead to another story. And, you know, honest to goodness truth. Somebody here in Picayune told me about the studio that was opening up in Slidell. So I got in touch with the people opening the studio in Slidell. And I said, you know, I write for this online newspaper. I write about art events. I'd like to write about your opening. So I met with her, did the interview, did the story. And from there it went to, oh, so-and-so is going to be our artist of the month. Would you like to interview them? Guess who I met that way? Lee and a lot of other really cool people because the art that they carried was not just paintings on the wall, not just photographs. It was graphic art. It was jewelry. It was household art, you know, artistic bowls and things. All of those because it wasn't just one story after all. It was multiple stories and that's what you as a writer can look for when you're out talking to these folks. And then what sort of hook might you use on this? Our hometown heroes maybe? If the hometown heroes won the game? How good the new uniforms looked that the booster club raised money for? You know, what's going to be your hook about that story? How would it be different if you were writing it for a newspaper sports page as opposed to an about town feature? <coughs> Might talk a little bit less about the, the sweat and the testosterone, <laughs> and the, the, the cleat marks in the, the greenery and more about the people who were there how hard they worked to raise the money for the event or, or for the stadium. I mean, there's a lot of ways you could go with it. Would a story be different if you were talking about the season opener versus a playoff game? You know, so how is your story going to be different for a season opener versus a playoff, quarterfinal versus semifinal versus finals? You know, is it the first event in the new stadium? What aspects are you going to use to bring life to that nonfiction so that it's not just a dry rendition of the facts? Your job is to nurture the seed of the facts, to help it blossom, to help it bloom, to help you write better and more interesting stories so that you as a writer reach those various potential markets that can help you advance your career. Find the story behind the story and you're off and running. Don't just settle for the facts in front of you. You can be an investigative reporter even if it's not talking about crime and corruption and all that stuff. You can be the investigative reporter about that human interest story, about that joyous occasion in the community. And it's going to help you build a portfolio that will make your writing career blossom. And that's what we're here for.